Thomas, welcome to the podcast. A pleasure to have you here. Well, thank you, Drew. It's nice to be here. Give us a few of your top line beliefs when it comes to what cancer is and why it's become so pervasive in our society. Well, I mean, we know what cancer is, is cell division out of control, dysregulated cell growth. That's the textbook definition of what cancer is. It's not a complicated phenomenon. I mean, it's just cell division out of control. Um, you know, what causes that is damage to oxidative phosphorylation. So, uh, and that, that, that leads to the dysregulation of the cells. So what control, why, why does one cell uh, start or a group of cells start to divide out of control in some tissue or some group of cells? And the answer is um, the organelle that controls the cell cycle and the differentiated state of the cell is corrupted. It's not producing energy the, re the way it should be. Um, and why is cancer so pervasive? Uh, because the environment that we live in today um, damages uh, the energy metabolism in, in these cells, leading to what I just described as dysregulated cell growth. So, so how does that happen? Well, as I said, and as I clearly said, there's, it's, it's, there's many secondary causes of cancer. There's only one primary cause, and that's, and that's damage to the ability of the cell to generate energy through oxygen. What could damage that? Well, radiation could damage that. Uh, chemical carcinogens can damage that. Intermittent hypoxia could do that. Uh, chronic inflammation can do that. Oncogenic viruses, uh, papilloma viruses, um, uh, uh, rare inherited mutations. These are all secondary risk factors, not the primary risk factor. Primary risk factor is damage to oxidative phosphorylation with a compensatory fermentation process. This is exactly what Warburg said. Uh, the, uh, the, the issue, of course, is it can happen in, in many, many different ways. So we are today living in an environment that makes all of this possible. And then you couple that with uh, a diet, highly processed carbohydrates, minimal exercise, uh, in conjunction with these secondary risk factors, and you have uh, an epidemic of one, over almost 1,700 people a day in the United States uh, dying from cancer. It's not a mystery. It's, to me, it's not a mystery at all. It's very clear uh, the, the, the basis for this. Connect the dots, again, starting with laying the groundwork here, now that you've talked about you know, what cancer is and getting everybody on the same page. Where do your beliefs differ from what is commonly understood out there, especially when it comes to cancer and metabolic health. You have to separate, you have to separate these two because the metabolic health is, is basically prevention. Um, uh, that's how you prevent, how do you prevent cancer? You just keep your mitochondria healthy. Uh, how do you do that? Well, you avoid the secondary risk factors as best you can. Some of these risk factors we are very difficult to avoid. Um, let's be honest. I mean, our society today is, I mean, we're sitting in traffic in cars. Uh, we don't have the necessary exercise to keep our mitochondria healthy. Uh, we're running around in a very uh, hyper, hyper society. Um, all, of these, all of these things uh, will cause chronic uh, damage to oxidative phosphorylation and then put yourselves at risk for some form of, uh, some form of cancer. But, but the, the other issue, the first part of your, your question, has to do with what the field thinks, the can what, uh, what's the origin of cancer. And they think it's a genetic disease. And, um, and this is the big, the big problem right now. Uh, the National Cancer Institute, which, which represents the federal government's treatment and uh, diagnosis and plans for managing cancer, are all locked into this uh, view that cancer is caused by somatic mutations. And that's clearly not the case. So, um, uh, any event, uh, so you were, you were representing a, uh, a misunderstanding of what the nature of cancer is. And that's coming from the, the National Cancer Institute itself. So the very organi organization that uh, sponsors hundreds of millions of dollars in research support is of the opinion uh, that cancer is something other than what it is. 
So when you have this force supported in, in large part by the pharmaceutical industry, so the uh, National Cancer Institute, supported by many of the major corporations of, of this area, all are on the uh, lockstep into thinking that cancer is a genetic disease, and therefore the therapies that are being developed are based on that uh, misunderstanding. It's not a genetic disease. So the therapies that are being thrown at this disease are ultimately going to fail for the majority of people, not all people, but the majority of people were not moving the needle of survivability in any significant way, except for a few folks. But if, if the needle were to be uh, changed, moved, why are we having almost 1,700 people a day dying from cancer? Uh, if we're making any major progress in any of the stuff that you hear about, why are we not changing the needle? Why, why do we continue to have all these dead people piling up everywhere? It's not just in the United States, it's worldwide. Um, and the treatments that you have for cancer worldwide are pretty much the same in every major country. And, uh, radiation and chemo and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a bunch of crap like that. And that's not part of this medieval. That kind of, that speaks to a fundamental misunderstanding and lack of knowledge uh, on, on what the nature of the disease is. So therefore, you don't get, in, you don't get progress and the disease continues to become uh, 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 an epi the epidemic continues. Not that complicated. And I've heard you in other interviews say we have made progress and a lot of people listening here are also see the headlines and sort of news and media that there's been progress. But what a lot of people don't understand, it's primarily been through the anti-smoking campaign. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Yeah, well, that was the big progress. That was huge. So, I mean, and another thing you have to realize, lung cancer is still the number one killer, the number one, even though people stop smoking. So uh, uh, pollutants in the environment can still give you lung cancer, even if you never smoked at all. But you're right. Um, we, we had this powerful anti-smoking campaign in the beginning of the 90s, uh, where smoking um, was be uh, the, the population recognized the health hazards, secondhand smoke and all this other kinds of stuff. And people began to slowly stop smoking. I mean, they were forced outside buildings. Uh, they had to smoke outside. Sometimes there was no smoking anywhere. And as the result of this, you know, behaviors began to change. And as behaviors began to change, the incidence of cancer, lung cancer especially, uh, started to decrease, and many other cancers as well that were all linked to smoking. Uh, so the progress we've made has been prevention, not in treatment. There's been no major advance in reducing death from treatments that have been developed. The majority of the advance has been in, in prevention, which was the anti-smoking campaign. So, so uh, when you hear about all these drugs on TV, or we, we got all this, they're all based on the somatic mutation theory of cancer. They will work very effectively for some people. There's no question about it, but not for the majority of people suffering from the majority of cancers. You shared that there's a fundamental misunderstanding of how cancer really is driven. We understand what it is, right? But it's a fundamental understanding of how it's driven. And you've written a book called Cancer as a Metabolic Disease. How did you come to the conclusions that there was this metabolic component that was a huge part of how cancer was built up and not this genetic component, which is how most of the Western world looked at and still looks at cancer? Yeah, well, we, we, were, um, <clears throat> we were studying epilepsy uh, for many years, and they used uh, calorie restricted ketogenic diets for managing seizures in kids uh, throughout the world. And um, we were also studying the, the biochemistry of cancer. When we treated mice with calorie restricted diets that had where your blood sugar would, would go down and the ketones would go up, which is an evolutionarily conserved adaptation to food restriction, um, these tumors were really shrinking up and going away, or not going away, but really getting small. And then we said, you know, what's going on here? And I said, uh, well, this is what Warburg said. Warburg said, if you lower the blood sugar, you're going you're gonna to restrict the availability of the fuel to the tumor. And um, what, what I did to test Warburg's hypothesis, I went and looked at the structure and, uh, and function of mitochondria and all the major cancer cells, and they're all damaged in some way or another. 
So, and in, in, in biology, a, a, a foundational principle is structure determines function. We know this. Evolutionary biology says structure determines function. So when you look under the electron microscope and look at cancer mitochondria, they're all in various ways damaged. When you look at their biochemistry, they're damaged. They're not going to be able to generate energy through using oxygen. So how in the hell are these cells growing out of control if they're not behaving like our normal cells? And Warburg said they ferment. Wow, this is exciting. They ferment. That means they get energy without oxygen. This is an ancient pathway, again, linked to evolutionary biology. So you go back and you find that all the organisms on the planet before oxygen came into the atmosphere 2.5 billion years ago were all fermenters and they were growing out of control, no regulation. So the tumor cells are doing nothing more than falling back on these ancient primitive pathways to grow. So the first thing you say was what the hell are they, you can't grow without energy. Energy is everything. It's not that complicated. Energy is every, ATP, ATP is energy. Without ATP, nothing can survive, nothing can grow. So the question is, where are you getting your energy from? I'm doing fermentation. What does that mean? Energy without oxygen. Oh, well, what can generate energy without oxygen? Glucose is the prime fuel, the sugar, glucose. And now we have discovered, in no uncertain terms, that they can ferment amino acids. But the key amino acid is the glutamine amino acid. So we put the two together, completely re restore what, what Warburg said. He just didn't know about the amino acid fermentation. And now we know. So I said, let's test. Why don't we test targeting these tumor cells by depriving them of glucose and the glutamine, the two fermentable fuels, and we kill them. Okay. And we're right at the beginning of this. We built the press pulse therapeutic process of how to kill cancer cells without toxicity. Now you say to yourself, well, why in the hell doesn't the field recognize what we're doing? Because they're locked into the uh, uh, ideological dogma that cancer is a genetic disease. So if you're locked into the dogma that cancer is a genetic disease, you're not even able to think about what I just said. And what's more, even if you do think about what I'm saying, you might lose your grant from the NIH because the NIH says cancer is a genetic disease. So you put it all together and, and you have this problem. The problem is we clearly understand how cancer arises. We clearly understand how to manage it. But the ideological dogma says, no, no, that's not right. Why? Because they don't, they, they either ignore or they don't understand what I just said. And I publish these papers. I try to write them in crayon so that even the, 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 the dullest of people could understand it. And, and they still, uh, they still won't understand. But I'll tell you who understands it. The people in the street understand it. I'll tell you that much. Which is why we want to have you on this podcast <laughs> as an ability to spread your message and to talk about your research. Now, you just shared a lot, and we're going to spend the rest of our time here unpacking a lot of those statements that are there. But I thought, because a lot of individuals are not familiar with the work of Otto Warburg, give us a little bit of a history lesson. Who was he and what got him started down the pathway of looking into cancer in the first place? Well, you know, Warburg... Um was an interesting character. As a, as a matter of fact, Sam Apple just wrote the book uh, Ravenous, uh, which is Warburg's history. Um, he, st he did a very good job uh, on his book and going over the early, the early parts of Warburg's career. And, uh, you know, he had come from a very aristocratic scientific background where um, many, is, many of his, his friends and his father's friends were all of the elite scientists of Germany. Uh, you know, Einstein and, and a number of these other top physicists, uh, biochemists and these kind. And uh, Warburg was, uh, was into this crowd. So he had this uh, very egalitarian background of uh, aristocratic uh, scientific uh, knowledge with a, with a bent of, of, of strict biochemistry with physics uh, approach to this, uh, this whole thing. I mean, he served in the in the Deutsches Heer, the German army in the First World War. He was a, an equestrian of a cavalry regiment in Prussia. Um, so he, he, Einstein apparently got him out of the army because they felt that he was too, he's too valuable to be riding his horse in, on the Russian front, uh, you know, um, coaxing the enemy to take a shot at him. And uh, they said his loss would be too of a great loss to science. So he was uh, brought back and set up his own lab uh, in Berlin. Uh, he had several labs over the years, but but um, yeah. So he started all this stuff, and um, his work was recognized. He, he didn't receive a Nobel Prize for his work on cancer, but he did for his work on on defining 
the enzyme responsible for generating energy through oxygen, um, the, the cytochrome C, he called it the respiratory enzyme. So he, well, he, knew, he knew energy metabolism in the cell better than anyone else at that time. He worked with Emden, he worked with Meyerhoff, he worked with all the great thinkers and uh, biochemists of that day. And he was able to, to understand the origin of energy metabolism in cancer. And he was the one, he and others showed that, you know, uh, if a tumor were growing in a rat uh, and you gave the rat cyanide, and of course, everybody knows about cyanide, they, that's the Kool-Aid, right? When you say he drank the Kool-Aid, the Kool-Aid from, um, what was that? What was that the group of people? They all committed suicide drinking the Kool-Aid? Yeah, um, yeah James Heaven's, Jones, Heaven's, Gate. Jones. Heaven's Gate. Yeah, well, J Jones, the Jones yeah, thing. Yeah, the Jones, yep. Yeah, yeah, they all, they all had, uh, okay. So here you put cyanide in Kool-Aid and you drink the Kool-Aid and you're dead instantly because cyanide kills you very quick, all right? But if you take a rat that has a big tumor and you give the, the rat cyanide, <clears throat> the rat will die, but not the tumor. So the tumor doesn't use oxygen. Are you passionate about the groundbreaking and heroic research of Dr. Thomas Seifert on metabolic therapy and cancer? So are we. That's why we've created something special for you, in collaboration with Johnny Rockermeyer, a German book publisher and translator. Introducing our collection of meticulously crafted books that distill the essence of Dr. Seifried's work. Dive into the science and discoveries. These summary books are your gateway to understanding the intricate world of metabolic ketogenic therapy in a clear, concise, and engaging way. Whether you're new to the subject or a seasoned enthusiast, our books offer insights that can change your life. Ready to explore this transformative knowledge? Visit our website at www.cancerasametabolicdisease.com to get your copy. You can buy the ebook there directly and the paper book via the provided links. Here's the best part. A portion of every purchase goes directly to support Dr. Thomas Seyfried's groundbreaking research. That's why the direct ebook purchase is the best option to donate as much as possible. You can see all of the donations Mr. Rockermeyer has already made at www.ketoforcancer.net. That's right, when you buy our books, you're not just investing in your own knowledge, you're also contributing to the future of cancer research. Help us make a difference. Together, we can drive change and save lives. Fascinating. And, and, and just explain, just connect the dots there just for a second here, because we have a lot of people that are lay people. How does cyanide work and why is oxygen a crucial part of that process? Yeah, which well, would... uh, there's, yeah the electrons from the food that we eat, we break down the food that we eat in the, in the uh, Krebs cycle. And we, we transfer uh, the foods that we eat, the electrons, to the electron transport chain. And this gradient... Uh, of electron movement coupled with a proton mode of gradient. Now I'm going to get into a little bit more deep biochemistry. Um, it creates a, a, a gradient uh, by, by, by forcing protons on one side of the membrane and the electrons then combine with oxygen and uh, the protons come back through and they, the power of the protons coming through and the oxygen accepting the electrons, you, 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 you produce ATP, the, 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 the fuel of life, energy, ATP, uh, the fuel of life. And um, uh, so the, the cells do that. And then the, the enzyme, uh, cytochrome C oxidase, is critical for delivering the electrons to oxygen. And cyanide binds that uh, cytochrome C oxidase and completely shuts down this whole transport process, shutting off, completely shutting off the ability of the cell to generate energy using oxygen. So the oxygen is there, but it, it can't bind the electrons. So, so what happens is you die real quick. You die real quick. The, the, why the cancer cell doesn't die from this is because they're fermenting and using fermentation, a completely different energy mechanism. It happens not in the mitochondria, it happens in the cytoplasm. Actually, a part of it does happen in the mitochondria. It's called mitochondrial substrate level phosphorylation. And we have defined that as the second major source but that can also happen without oxygen. So, um, so we have two forms of energy in the cancer cell, neither of which need oxygen. And they're both these ancient fermentation pathways. One is in the cytoplasm of the cell and the other is in the mitochondria of the cell. Now it's very important when I speak like this because there's a lot of folks out there that might not um, be familiar with the terminology. 
And as I say to cancer patients, if you want to stay alive, you'd be very, it would be in your interest to understand basic biology because the guys who are going to treat you uh, at the top medical schools appear not to have that level of knowledge. Otherwise, they wouldn't be treating you with the way they're treating you. So it's up to every individual who would like to survive cancer to understand some of the things that I'm saying uh, because it's, it's their soul, it's their existence on the planet that will, all, that will ultimately be uh, uh, involved with this. Right. Or they so have when, I speak like this, yeah, when I say, well, people say, well, he's saying stuff I don't understand. Hey, that's their personal problem. You want to stay alive? You better start understanding some of this stuff. It's called scientific <laughs> literacy. Yeah. And unfortunately, in our country today, from the COVID absurdity, you can see that m majority of people in our country today lack scientific literacy. So, so and I don't, I don't want to sound like, hey, but, but you get cancer, you better understand some of this stuff because you're going to be part of the, the you're going to be part of the planet before long. Yeah. And even if the people treating the folks, knock on wood, unfortunately, for those that have gotten cancer, my, you know, I want to talk to you about my mom's story, was diagnosed with breast cancer many years ago took very much a similar approach to what you talk about here, kind of had to assemble her own team and everything when it came to breast cancer, knock on wood, she's doing okay. But for the people that, you know, get cancer, super unfortunate disease, my heart goes out to everybody. There's probably people listening today because you've become so popular on YouTube and on the podcasting circuit that are seeking out your information that are listening today that have cancer. So even if they are treated by people that have that knowledge, there's a sense where the, we even saw this during COVID, consensus medicine becomes such a force that even people who have questions are scared to ask those questions that are there because there's such a consensus. And that happens in a lot of industries, but it even happens in medicine as well. And I think that's the positive side of a lot of the questioning that came out of even things like COVID is that we understood that just because something has consensus around it doesn't mean necessarily that it's accurate. No, not always, but sometimes it can be. But but again, you have to be able to determine, um, you know, what's I don't want to go down the COVID path because there's, it's a political hot water. Right. And that's and obviously a whole separate. Everybody gets everybody gets like fired up about one thing or another. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but I think but, your larger point you know, we're is dealing with cancer now. COVID's gone. Let's OK, let's let's we're, that, uh, that that's already down the river. Right? Yeah. Let's, and, and your larger point that is that. Your, your we're larger, all happy that, that we don't have to worry about that thing anymore. Right? Your larger point, nonetheless, with cancer is this. What we're doing is not working. In fact, there might be, and we'll get to this in a second, our current treatments today, which are a lot of the same treatments that have been here since basically, what, the 50s? Is that accurate to say, right? Yeah, it could be. You know, a lot of treatments minus some new evolving things, which you have your own thoughts on immunotherapy, et cetera. There may be even some situations where they're actually potentially doing more harm than good. Yeah, but I think so. Without, uh, but, you know, you have, yeah, you have to realize that... Um, yeah, I mean, there's what we, we we say this cancer survivors. I mean, there's a lot of millions of cancer survivors that have survived uh, standard of care, which is the radiation and chemo and whatever else that that would be involved. But but many of those folks um, pay a real price uh, for that survival. Um, they suffer immensely uh, if they do survive. And, and many times they, they have ailments and debilities and problems uh, that came about as the, as the result of the toxic treatments they received. Many, many people are suffering from the surgical mutilations uh, that their bodies have endured. Uh, many people are suffering from uh, uh, ad adverse consequences of high-dose poisons uh, that their bodies have been exposed to. Uh, many people are suffering from high, uh, the ramifications of high dose radiation. So you have to look at the litany of ailments uh, associated with cancer survivors. Uh, and that's a, a, an area of the emerging medicine now, cancer survivor medicine. Uh, so if you feel that you have survived these toxic, massively toxic and mutilation treatments, uh, you have many people, not all people, have a lot of um, psych psychological problems, neuropsychiatric problems. Many people have hormonal imbalance problems. Many people have problems with their microbiomes. Many people ha ha have problems uh, with uh, uh, metabolic homeostasis. So you, you have a whole litany of problems that you never had, but for the fact that you survived the treatments that were given to you. 
And then there's those folks who, who don't survive these treatments. And some of these newer treatments will kill you faster than the disease itself uh, with the hope that you might be one of those you know, percentage of people that actually does respond really well to the treatment. And everybody wants to be that person who really does well. Uh, but in fact, many people uh, uh, don't, are not that person. And uh, they suffer immensely uh, with chronic problems, sometimes for the remainder of their life. And, and a lot of times they don't live uh, as long as, those, as, as they could have lived had they not been subjected to these horrifically toxic treatments to manage a disease, which in my mind does not require the use of toxic treatments. So, um, so we have this problem. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a massive tragedy in my mind. It's just, it's just something that doesn't need to have to have to happen. We'll chat more about that. I want to put a little bow tie on some of your history that you were talking about with Otto Warburg, because I think it's important here before we get into your work and research, which you gave a little preview on, what were the core fundamental things that we later understood that Otto got right? And what were some of the things that he kind of got wrong that you've had a chance to build on? Well, he got right that the origin of cancer involves disruption of oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, he got right the fact that in order to stay alive, the cell needs to find an alternative energy source. And that alternative energy source is fermentation. So this is very interesting because cells, uh, many cells will be subjected he, what Warburg clearly said is that if oxfos, oxidative phosphorylation, energy using oxygen is acutely damaged, it will kill the cell, just like I said to cyanide. Cyanide will kill cells massively fast. Okay, if you kill a cell, it can never become a cancer cell. So the origin of cancer has to be a chronic interruption of energy through oxygen, oxidative phosphor. It can't be acute. So Warburg was 100% correct about that. He says, if you damage this system too acutely, you'll kill the cell, and a dead cell can never become a cancer cell. So the damage to this uh, respiration has to be chronic, and it has to be chronic because it requires the cell to form uh, an alternative. It has to be able to upregulate alternative form of energy to replace the lost energy from oxidative phosphorylation, which is fermentation. So there's only two forms of energy that we know about in cells. One is oxidative phosphorylation, which is the use of oxygen. We breathe. We're breathing. You and I which are breathing. Is what normal cells do. All cells, majority, they're not the red blood cells, but, but most of the cells in our body will be using oxygen for energy um, and producing water and CO2. So every time we exhale, we blow out CO2 and water, moisture. Uh, and um, uh, those are the waste products of oxidative phosphorylation. And it's highly, highly efficient. So it allows our cells to do all kinds of unique functions, brain cells, liver cells, colon cells. They all do their own specific function. They're all using oxidative phosphorylation. And what happens then is in order to get cancer, you have to have a cell that can transition from oxidative phosphorylation to the ancient pathway of fermentation. And if, as I said, if it happens too quickly, the cancer the cell will die. But if it happens chronically, the cell then has an opportunity, like exactly like Warburg said, to shift away from oxidative phosphorylation and uh, rely more on the substrate level phosphorylation. So, so um, uh, this is this is the transition from one source of energy to a second source of energy. But you have to also realize that the organelle inside the cell that's responsible for oxidative phosphorylation is the mitochondria. And the, mito the same organelle that allows us to generate energy very efficiently also regulates the cell cycle. The cell is stabilized in what we call a differentiated state. It's stable, not growing, and it's doing its, its metabolically designed activities. Well, why? Because the organelle that controls all this, the mitochondria, is operational. When that organelle loses gradually its capability of maintaining energy and the cell slowly s s uh, forces into fermentation, the very organelle that controls the differentiated state loses that control and the cells fall back on proliferation, which is what the cell would normally do if it weren't appropriately regulated by the mitochondria. So the mitochondria controls the cell cycle. And when that organelle becomes defective, 
it, you get two things. The cell is fermenting and proliferating at the same time. And it happens slowly, gradually. And as the waste products of fermentation are lactic acid and succinic acid, acidification of the microenvironment, which then feeds back further damaging oxidative phosphorylation. And you get this situation called an escalating situation of biological chaos leading to a dysregulated cell growth, a change in the microenvironment, which then feeds forward to continue this abnormal uh, growth. And by the time you see it, it has already uh, established a microenvironment. Now you begin to see something because for a long time, that would be completely uh, go unnoticed, uh, either by the patient uh, or by any, any uh, 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 what we call scanning, screening, any of these things. You see something by scanning and screening that's already a well-established, uh, developed uh, uh, growth. Uh, whether that growth is metastatic or not metastatic, uh, whether it's malignant or benign, you know, that, that all can happen. But all of that happens uh, on this transition from oxidative phosphorylation to fermentation. And the type of cell that's involved with this uh, determines whether or not that, that growth will be malignant or benign. And that, that, can be, uh, uh, that also has to come into the, the question. But in cancer, we're always concerned with the malignant aspect of this growth that's out of control. So the, the, the question, of course, is what is driving this dysregulated growth, what's the, every, we, it's dysregulated because the mitochondria are, in, in, if, in, are ineffective. Okay, uh, what, what is, what's driving and, the, and the- Before the, you get into that, can, can I just, from my standpoint, repeat back to you what I'm sort of hearing big picture as a layperson, not a medical expert, to make sure that I have the correct understanding, is that long before human beings were around, cells had this methodology of getting energy through fermentation, as you've described. And that's sort of built in to the survival mechanism of not every cell, but a lot of cells that are there. And through a combination of things, which you're going to get to in a second, things that are driving this, we have created a situation where we forced cancer, we forced normal cells to, in a way, become cancerous. We call that a disease, but if we really look at it, it's almost a survival mechanism of the cell switching from one way of going about creating energy to being forced to consuming energy through another pathway, this fermentation pathway. But in that process, the cells, the cancer cells, which were previously healthy, they now have become out of control and they have dysregulated, unregulated growth, which ultimately ends up leading to a whole cascading situations of problems. Is that accurate? Is there anything I missed in that? No, no, I think that's pretty good. I, I, I think you did a good job on that. And, and uh, I, I think that the muta and during this process of mitochondrial uh, dysfunction that happens gradually, the mitochondria throw out what we call reactive oxygen species, ROS. These are radical species that uh, can damage proteins, uh, lipids, and the DNA, the nucleic acids, RNA and DNA, can be damaged by these ROS. So the, the, they are largely, uh, uh, come, they come out of the mitochondria uh, because the mitochondria, as the mitochondria of the cell becomes more and more dysfunctional, they, they produce, rather than producing ATP, the energy that they normally would produce, they produce ROS. And the, R, the ROS are carcinogenic and mutagenic. So the mutations that you see in the cancer cell are downstream effects of the damage to the reactive of the mitochondria. So the field of cancer is focusing their energies and their attention on downstream stuff that is, that is not relevant to the majority of cancers. So when, when you hear people speak of the ALK mutation, the P53 mutation and all these mutations, they're all downstream effects. They're not the cause of cancer. They're the effects of the production of reactive oxygen species because the mitochondria have become abnormal. They're throwing out these radicals that are damaging lipids and proteins and causing mutations in the nucleus. And the field, almost the entire cancer field, is focused on all this kind of stuff. And I'm saying, and others in Warburg said, no, no, no. 
you got to go back and figure out where the energy is coming from because you're collecting mutations in the nucleus that are largely irrelevant, but they're coming because of the acidification in the microenvironment. They're coming because of the reactive oxygen species. But the most important question is, well, how, what is the fuel that is driving the dysregulated cell growth? Okay, what's the energy? What are these cells using to divide? And as you said, when we go back in time, we find out that all of the cells that existed on the planet we're using those ancient fermentation pathways because there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. So they grew dysregulated growth. And the interesting thing is they would grow without regulation uh, uh, until the fermentable fuels in the microenvironment were dissipated. And then these cells would up and die. So that told me right away that uh, the way you kill cancer cells is you deprive them of their fermentable fuels. And because that's what's driving the dysregulated growth. They're, they're dysregulated because the mitochondria are no longer in control of the system. And now they're just growing as long as they have fermentable fuels, just like our, our uh, ancestral cells 2.5 billion years ago. Uh, uh, so now why did, why did biology start to have integrated action? And that was with the symbiotic interaction between uh, one type of protista bacteria that could harvest the energy of oxygen in the cell, which led to metazoans, which are uh, more than one cell. Uh, um, they're they're, they're uh, multicellular. Multicellularity arose with the origin of the mitochondria in the cytoplasm. That led to regulated growth. So you have to go back really long in evolutionary terms to find such systems where uh, preceded uh, mitochondria in the evolution of organisms on the planet. And these cancer cells are going back that far. So they will grow out of control as long as they have fermentation fuels in their microenvironment. And as we have shown, and Warburg had shown, uh, glucose is a prime fermentable fuel in the microenvironment of the tumor cell. And as we have now shown, uh, 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 the, the amino acid glutamine is another fermentable fuel in the tumor microenvironment. So the solution to the cancer problem now becomes very clear. You need to restrict the availability of the fermentable fuels while transitioning the body over to fuels that cannot be fermented, like fatty acids and ketone bodies. So this is a, a clear strategy to manage cancer without toxicity. Um, you take, you target simultaneously the two fuels that are driving the beast, both fermenta fermentable fuels, and you transition the rest glucose of the body and over glutamine. to uh, glucose and glutamine are the fermentable fuels in the microenvironment. And then you transition the body over to uh, ketone bodies or fatty acids, which cannot be fermented. So these two fuels cannot be fermented by cancer cells, which require fermentation for growth. So it becomes very clear, but you can't, Ketones do not kill cancer cells. Ketones and fatty acids are for the good of the normal cells of our body. They, they don't need glucose and glutamine if they can respire fatty acids in ketone bodies. They don't have dif dysfunctional mitochondria. The cancer cell does. So we can marginalize the cancer cell simply by depriving it of its fermentable fuels and protecting all of the normal cells in the body by shifting them over to ketone bodies, which now becomes a non-fuel for the cancer cell. So by Does that make sense? It absolutely makes sense. And really connecting the dots here for the audience that's following along, your early work in the field of epilepsy and showing that uh, essentially a ketogenic diet, right? Because again, we're talking about that. And you know, ketogenic diet is the most studied diet when it comes to uh, uh, brain health and specifically people dealing with epilepsy. It was the first treatment, right, that was... Um, used for targeting, I believe it was kids originally. I yeah. think some past. Yeah, it was uh, Wilder, 1921. 1921. Uh, yeah, but he, 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 Wilder studied epilepsy, but he realized that if you put kids on water only fasting, the seizures would go away. Right. But he realized that uh, what is what, when you don't eat food, what's the major changes in the blood and the blood sugar goes down and, and ketone bodies, which are um, uh, water soluble breakdown product of fats. So the, fat, the, cell, the fats in our body uh, um, are mobilized. These fatty acids then go into the bloodstream. They go to the liver and the liver chops them up like a wood, chip, wood chipper and makes small um, uh, molecules called ketone bodies, 
uh, and these are water soluble products of the breakdown of fatty acids. And they go to the brain. They can replace glucose in the brain. They, they can be burned by the heart, by muscles. So the combination between ketone bodies and fatty acids uh, can be respired if you have a good respiration system. With respect to epilepsy, now here's the interesting thing. So Wilder says, uh, well, we can't you know, cure epilepsy by have, starving people to death. Um, so let's build a diet that does what a normal diet, a, a normal water only fasting would do. And if you eat diets that have very low carbohydrates in, in restricted amounts, blood sugar goes down and ketones go up. So it was kind of a, a calorie restricted fat diet. Um, fat, you know, you, you can eat avocados and you could eat certain things that would give you uh, uh, fats. And that seemed to manage epileptic seizures. And then, of course, in the 1930s, certain drugs uh, came on that uh, made it a lot easier for patients to say, oh, we have a drug now that um, uh, can do what a ketogenic diet does. So let's, let's forget about the ketogenic diets. Uh, but uh, Jim Abrams and his son Charlie started the Charlie Foundation um, because Charlie was, his son Charlie Abrams was uh, almost killed by, by, by various drugs and treatments that he was taking when he could have done a ketogenic diet. So it was resurrected, resurrected in the late 90s by Jim Abrams. And uh, we were all working on epilepsy. And um, we found no, no uncertain terms that this that management of seizures was directly linked to the, re the blood glucose. And uh, the, the difference between cancer and epilepsy is we really don't know how uh, ketogenic diets uh, stop epileptic seizures. Uh, we know it changes the energy metabolism of the brain, uh, but the mechanisms, the key, me the clear mechanism is still under massive investigation. And it, and it seems to work against a variety of different uh, epilepsies. So some people inherit an epilepsy, some people get it from a viral infection, some people get it from a bang on the head, some people get it from tumors. It seems like a ketogenic diet seems to reduce the excitability of the brain in many different interesting mechanisms, which are under investigation. Uh, but we do know that sometimes these children that have, se that have managed seizures for quite a long time, months, many months, all of a sudden take one, one sip of a Coca-Cola or a fruit juice or something, spiking the blood sugar, leading to an explosive breakthrough seizure, which is very clear. So we, I, my colleagues and I in the epilepsy field knew this, that how is it possible that you can have a child managed with seizures for such a long period of time, and all they have to do is take one sip of a, of a, of a fruit juice or a bite of a cupcake, and, and within minutes they're blown up into a, a, major, uh, a major seizure. So it was clear that you had to maintain low blood sugar, low stable blood sugar to manage an epileptic seizure. In cancer, we don't see an explosive growth of cells uh, as the result of taking a bite out of a, uh, out of a cupcake uh, or, or a, a, sweet, a, a, a sugary drink. You can't see it. You can't feel it. But you know it's happening uh, because we know the cancer cell can't live. Can't, one of the fermentable fuels is, is, is glucose. And, 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 and sugar is, is, is fructose glucose, so it's broken down. So the glucose immediately goes to the tumor cell and is used to, for the growth of the tumor cell. But you can't say, well, you know, the guy says, oh, I, you know, I've been ketogenic diet. I think I'm okay. Let me just bite this can, uh, uh, cupcake. Uh, it, you can't see whether your tumor cell is going to be growing like you can see a breakthrough epileptic seizure. It's very clear, uh, but not, 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 not a growing tumor cell. You just have to know that to manage cancer, you have to keep that sugar under control. And the second fuel is glutamine, which there's no diet. And everybody keeps asking me, oh, you know, glutamine is so healthy for us and all this. And it is. Uh, people need to know that, that uh, um, glutamine is not a risk factor for cancer. Glucose is for, uh, for creating inflammation, but not glutamine. Um, so you need specific drugs to target the glutamine for cancer. You can't, you can't do it with any diet. People, oh, I, oh, you know, I take glutamine for weightlifting and all this other stuff. That's great. If you don't have cancer, don't worry about it. So, um, so glutamine is an important metabolite. So, so to connect the dots, just like I did earlier with cancer and really talking about it in a way to look at cancer as a survival mechanism as a cell, we see it as this destructive disease, which it absolutely is. And it causes havoc for people, but from a biological level, this is just a cell trying to survive. So it's tapping into an old evolutionary pathway, which is this fermentation process. So to bring that same sort of thinking over to these two fuel sources, fuel sources for cancer, specifically glucose, really what you're saying, if I understand correctly, please correct me if I'm wrong, is that a ketogenic diet 
as a therapeutic approach to cancer in a way is cutting off the fuel source that is used in this fermentation process. So still providing fuel for our healthy cells, but taking away the primary fuel sources that cancer uses to grow and grow rapidly inside of the body. Is that a correct understanding? Yes. Yes. And, 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 the, and the second part you said is absolutely essential. They have to know that the ketone bodies from the ketogenic diets uh, are serving as fuel sources for the normal non-cancerous cells in our body, actually making them even healthier than they were. Um, there's another interesting biochemical mechanism by which burning ketones uh, enhances the health and vitality and energy efficiency of normal cells. Um, uh, so that's, that's one issue. That is, the normal cells burning ketone bodies get healthier when on, that's, that, that's why one of the health benefits of ketogenic diet. I hate to say ketogenic diet um, because it, it, is, it is that, but it's more than that. Um, it's it's a, a general health, uh, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a health system for the body. Right, because there's um, stress response is a major part of it, yeah. as you've talked about. Yeah. There's many yeah. other things. Yeah. It's not just that yeah. we're going to throw this yeah. one diet, although no. diet is a key part yes. of removing the fuel source of cancer in your work and approach. Yeah. But this is a whole system. And maybe when we have a few minutes here in a little bit, we can talk about what the whole system is. Yeah, well, I think you're right. I mean, you have to break it down into its various parts. Right. So, um, you know, the, the, and, and ketosis in a diet can be achieved uh, with carnivore diets, Mediterranean diets, uh, even vegan diets, although not as effective, but they can still uh, generate uh, a state of ketosis, uh, which is then putting pressure, uh, uh, help, making the normal cells healthy while at the same time restricting the fuel that's is absolutely required for the growth uh, of the tumor. So again, you have to bring the body into a more metabolically stabilized state. Once you get it, once the body is in, into that state, then you can then use low doses of various kinds of drugs and procedures that will work synergistically with this new ketotic state, making these tumor cells more and more vulnerable to death by putting them under metabolic stress. And that stress is enhancing the health, the healthy cells of the body while slowly degrading and eliminating uh, the tumor cells. Right. It's not that you're out there, somebody saying that, oh, you know, just by cutting off the fuel source, these cells are going to die. No, there might need to be approaches like drugs. And there's a lot of great ones that are out there and we're lucky through modern medicine to have access to them. But there could be a protocol to introduce low amounts that then can actually kill the cancer, depending on what type of cancer people are dealing with. Yeah. And some of these drugs, you know, um, can be used in very low concentrations because the, tu the tumor cells now, when they're under this metabolic stress, become extremely vulnerable to killing. So we're not saying we can throw out all these chemotherapies and all this other kinds of stuff. Uh, we just need to know how to use it more effectively and in the right way so that a patient can just take a small dose of this stuff when the body is in ketosis and then eliminate the tumor without toxicity. Um, we, we know this. So, so that's why uh, some of my colleagues in the clinic in Istanbul are using very low chemo uh, drugs uh, together with uh, ketogenic metabolic therapy. It's a process by which we're both enhancing the health and vitality of the normal cells while slowly degrading tumor cells without producing significant toxicity uh, in the rest of the body. It's a beautiful strategy. Uh, you just got to know about it. You have to know, understand why, what, what you're doing, why you're doing it. And you have to understand the nature of the biological processes, which makes this metabolic approach uh, the most logical and likely will be the most effective way to manage cancer for the majority of tumors. So we'll get into the challenge with the way that clinical trials are done today, because the question always from the people that are in the medical field are always like, well, where's the evidence? Where's the evidence? And usually they're talking about these randomized, you know, placebo controlled trials. We're going to get to that in a second. But first, let's talk about at least your studies of what you've shown in mice. And then also, I do believe that you've collected case studies that are out there. Do you have case studies in, um, I've seen the ones that are there in animals. Do you also have case studies in humans? showing that 
when you starve the cancer and then also use these uh, low dose um, concentrations of drugs to kill the cancer that people can ultimately uh, radically slow down or even, you know, kill off the cancer that they're dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, th this is, uh, this is, th this is the strategy, you know, to slow, to slow the whole tumor down and degrade it and degrade it, uh, very slowly. So, uh, and, and, um, and have you and your team collected case studies together of yeah. different groups that are out there? It's still emerging. And obviously that's one of yeah. the big problems with this is that it's not like MD Anderson or the, you know, here in UCLA in Los Angeles is practicing this new approach. This is sort of a whole new approach to cancer in itself. But what documentation do we have at least right now before we get into clinical okay. trials? Okay, we base it on two two things. Before you, you you have to have a logical mechanism of action for doing something. Uh, in other words, there has to be there has to be a scientific basis for why you would do why you would uh, do a trial in the first place. Okay, why you would treat a human, a mouse, a dog, or whatever. It has to be some. What do you just? grab something off the shelf and, you know, chug it down. Maybe, you know, maybe that, that, that solution over there might work. No, no, there's no mechanism. We, we in Warburg have, and others have clearly defined what the underlying process of the tumor cell is, right? We know that from the, from the preclinical studies, from the, the cell culture studies, we, we know that. We know, the we know what's driving the cell. So now to do, take a human being that has a tumor, and you say, we're going to now, based on our understanding of the scientific mechanisms that are responsible for your dysregulated cell growth, we will now institute a therapeutic approach designed to target that process. And when we do that, we get really good results. The problem is you cannot take 50 people and do this because you, you need to know each person you have to know that person's metabolism. You have to know that person's sex, age. You have to know what other conditions in that individual are there that need to be addressed before you can start uh, doing this stuff. You, before you can start treating a patient with met ketogenic metabolic therapy, does that person have parasites? Does that person have type 2 diabetes? Hypertension. There's a whole variety of things that have to be evaluated up front before you can then elicit a, a, a therapeutic strategy for managing that person's uh, situation. So you need to do a very comprehensive blood work on that individual. And you, so you can take 20 individuals and every all 20 may have a different profile of blood markers and things. So you might have to ease one person in a little bit differently than, a, than another person. You need to try to manage uh, as best you can, bring that person into a new metabolic state then once that person is in a, a metabolic state, then you can s follow the, look at uh, non-invasive uh, strategies for man manager, manage, managing his tumor. What is that? CAT scan, PET scan, you, you, these kinds of non-invasive ways to determine whether or not the individual's tumor is showing some level of response to the treatment that you're, that you're using. Then once you have that, look, the tumor becomes somewhat stabilized. Uh, then you can then introduce very low doses of certain uh, uh, drugs that are known to act, act synergistically uh, with the diet or with the, the new metabolic homeostatic state. Drugs that will target the glycolysis, the glucose util utilizing pathway. Drugs that target the glutamine utilizing pathway. And they would be delivered in pulses and they would not be delivered in great excess amounts because they're working synergistically. How does the, number one, how does the patient, how do you ask the guy, how are you feeling today? I feel great. What are you guys doing? So, so I said, well, that's good. That's a good, that's a good first step. So we can't, you, people are, where's the evidence? What are you going to do? Take a hundred people and just, you know, throw, throw something at them that they, you have no clue. You don't understand the biology. You don't understand. You got to, you got to, we work with small numbers of people, individual case reports, and then we publish those case reports. And then we look at what worked for this person, what worked for that person. And then we can start to get some sort of a strategy together. So the answer to why are there's no major clinical trials? There are, most of them are not done correctly 
because the people doing them are don't have an understanding of the biochemistry that's re, that's underlying this. So I, I I I don't fault them because a lot of people themselves would like to be treated with metabolic therapy. Uh, the problem is that the 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 the, the practi practitioners, the physicians don't always have the necessary background or understanding of what they are supposed to do, how to do it, and how to measure outcomes. We're, we're in the process right now of writing a very comprehensive uh, treatment protocol for managing glioblastoma, which is the uh, one of the most deadly and unmanageable cancers that, that we know about today. We have a very comprehensive strategy for managing this kind of a tumor. Can it be done that's another thing. Oh, we have this tremendous uh, treatment protocol for glioblastoma, but nobody will use it. And the answer is, how could that be? Because we have the science behind it. We know from preclinical uh, uh, research, from our preclinical research, that it will be very effective. We have individuals, case reports, knowing that it will be effective. Why can't it be used in, in like the major, major uh, oncology centers? because they need to have the standard of care done first. And I told them, I says, they, they, so we have, we have, you have to have the groups of people. Okay, we have one group of people get the standard of care. 90% uh, of them are dead before five years, more. Okay, then we have metabolic therapy used with the standard of care. Okay, so we're starting to see these folks doing a little bit better than standard of care by itself. Well, where is metabolic therapy by itself without radiation and chemo? Ah, uh -huh. can't do that. No, not allowed. Not allowed to be done at any of the major medical centers. The board, the, the IRB Institutional Review Board has nixed those kinds of studies. Because they would say so that like, it's, you're basically, you're harming the patient because you're not following what we've established to be the standard of care, which comes from the fact that, hey, cancer is a genetic disease, not a metabolic condition. Right, not a me yeah. metabolically yeah. driven. Well, it comes from the it comes from the ideology. Not only that cancer is a metabolic disease, but their complete lack of understanding of the of what their actual standard of care treatments are actually doing to contribute to the rapid growth of the tumor in the brain. So, as I have published very clearly over and over again, when you irradiate somebody's brain with a tumor in it, you explode the amount of glutamine in that microenvironment, giving those tumor cells an absolute. Uh, a, 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 a bouquet of growth factors and fuels to grow out of control. So, so uh, you, you create a mush in the brain. Uh, you give the patient high dose steroids to control the swelling of the brain from the radiation heat. Uh, steroids are like drinking Coca-Cola. They make your blood sugar go up to, to very high levels. So, so what are you doing? The very treatment that you're throwing at these poor folks is contributing to the recurrence and the death of the patients. And I've said that over and over again. Why, no, why there's so little survival for glioblastoma? Uh, in every major medical center in the world, it's so consistent that people are all dead before 40 months. Not all. You get very rare survivors occasionally. Almost everybody in 10 years is dead for sure. Um, wh what are you doing? Uh, I said that's the worst thing you can possibly do to somebody with a brain tumor is irradiate them. And yet they continue to do it. And one has to say to these guys, what's wrong with you? Don't you, what do you ignore the scientific evidence? What are you doing to these poor folks? I've clearly shown that that's what's killing, creating the recurrence of the tumor and killing the patients. Why? Because it frees up mass amounts of the two fermentable fuels needed by the, that's the science behind it. You got to understand the science behind what's going on. And it makes perfect sense why these folks are not surviving. Uh, they, they come, they look like they're doing well for a while. And then all of a sudden that tumor comes back like a raging bull and the, the, the liquefaction of the brain from the radiation. Uh, it's just like, it's tragic. It's, it, it's, 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 it's malpractice as far as I'm concerned, you know, to do something like that. It'd be one thing if there wasn't any evidence. It'd be one thing to say, well, this is the best we can do. But when I publish evidence and I clearly show that that treatment is responsible for the demise of the majority of these brain cancer patients, it's criminal to be doing something like this. I'm telling you, man, this is like nuts. And, you know, people are saying that, oh, you know, uh, it's hard to reproduce science. There's nothing. You should see how reproducible the death, the death of the cancer patient is. You can't design better experiments for reproducibility than how fast standard of care kills GBM patients. That's terrible. Isn't that terrible to say something like that? It's terrible. Well, why don't the patient, 
Uh, go look at the data in the literature. It's not coming from my mouth. It's coming from the data from the, from the top medical schools. Yeah. I mean, I get I, me, the audience, everybody listening here, they can feel your passion for what. Well, feels- you know, when you see enough of this, when you see enough of this crazy shit for as long as I have, <laughs> you say to yourself, what am I going? Maybe I'm going nuts. No, no, you know? it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's basically you're, you're being, you know, your work and research is being, you know, I, the phrases are overused, but it's being gaslit by the medical profession. Many of them, again, under that sort of, this is the consensus It's already been established. You can't question it. Until, unfortunately, we're in a situation oh, where... Why, why, uh, Jethro, why don't you get one of these guys from the top medical school and ask them, why the hell are you radiating your patients? Don't you know it's killing them all? Go ask them that. <laughs> See what kind of response you get. Yeah, you probably no, won't even uh, want to come on your show. They, they, they wouldn't <laughs> want to come on, for sure, for sure. Well, well, we've got to ask them these questions, because I'm certainly asking them. No, we do. It's important. And I think, like you said earlier, the groundswell is coming from the lay people who are hearing are interested in hearing directly from sources like yourself. This is why, you know, podcasts around the world have really taken off because people want to hear the full story and they want to get a chance to decide if they want to investigate something and they want to weigh the pros and cons of looking at stuff. Here's the, here's the problem. I, I can, I can say all this stuff because I have done the basic research myself. I have looked into the concepts. I have studied these concepts. The problem and the great tragedy is when the cancer patient with a glioblastoma, lung cancer, breast cancer, whatever it is, they go to the top medical schools and they tell them, I want metabolic therapy. And they, oh, we can't do that here because there's no evidence that it works. Um, So these poor folks are now, hear what I say. They get all fired up. They go down to the top medical school to say, I want metabolic therapy. Well, we don't do that here. Well, who does? Oh, I'm going to lose my license if I do that. What the hell is going on with that stuff? So I feel bad when they say, whoa, where's Seafried's clinic? I don't have a clinic. I, I'm not an MD. I don't, I don't run. I don't treat patients. Um, why are there no clinics? Well, because a lot of the folks that would need to be doing this uh, could lose their license if they treat patients without the standard of care. So why is the standard of care written in granite? Why, why can't it be modified in some way where the medical schools, they should be the ones Dana Farber, MD Anderson, Sloan Kettering, the Moffitt, the Fred Hutch, all of these major cancer centers throughout the country should be the ones that are doing this. Why are they not doing it? That's the question. Yeah. You know, what's that famous uh, Max, is it Max Planck quote uh, from the German uh, Nobel uh, Prize winner, winner, the the theoretical physicist? Uh, I'll paraphrase here, but advances in science and you could extrapolate to medicine too. Uh, you know, advances in science happen one funeral at a time because it's very hard to get the old guard interested in doing things that has them completely re-question their core and basic understanding. Well, yeah, but then we have to get rid of those. Well, okay. Well, that's good in concept, but we're, we're, kill, we're allowing people to die. I mean, it's not like this is an insignificant thing. It's a very tragic I mean, thing. We, very we, tragic have, thing. we have almost 1,700 people a day dying from cancer, right? And we have to wait for these guys that can't understand the basic concepts to die, die off before we're, uh, we allow these poor folks that could be alive, that could be doing better for a bunch of uh, people that are standing in the way because they, they, they either don't want to know about this or they can't understand it. I mean, this is tragedy. So, I mean, so what are you going to do? Uh, that has to come from the folk, the people themselves. They're the ones that are going to be uh, affected by this. So they have to demand. They, they, people themselves have to demand. They want metabolic therapy for crying out loud. And if they don't do it, somebody else has to do it. Put pressure on the congressmen. The, put pressure on the senators. And then President Biden himself says, oh, we want to we want to uh, bring cancer death. We could do that in five years, not 25 years. It's just that he's, I don't know what, he, unfortunately, he's not any different from the rest of the folks. They just can't understand uh, the metabolic therapy, that uh, the understanding the science behind it. And they keep gravitating towards moonshot stuff and, and CAR-T immunotherapy. And all that stuff is based on the somatic mutation theory of cancer. If the somatic mutation theory of cancer is not correct, what is the probability of reducing the death rate from cancer? It's not, not going to happen. 
So uh, it, you got to realize, man, it's a totally different kind of disease. It needs a completely different strategy. Well, why we have people listening here and a big part of their activism is making sure they have the education to understand and connect the dots. Give us a sense. You know, we didn't fully connect the dots for people. You know, you're talking about glucose as one of the primary fuel sources of cancer. Give us a diagnosis of our current modern industrialized lifestyle and really help the folks that are listening today connect the dots of what are the primary sources of, you know, large amounts of calories containing glucose inside of our, our lifestyle. And also let's get into, you know, beyond diet, let's just talk a little bit about, you know, sedentary lifestyle and the amount of stress that's there and how those things play into it as well. Well, now, now we're back on the prevention side. So all of those things that you just mentioned are critical for preventing cancer from happening in the first place. I mean, we are, we're only concerned about treating it after you have cancer. But if you don't have cancer, you don't have to ever worry about the kinds of treatments. Or if you can live a diet and lifestyle that would put, keep your mitochondria healthy so that you don't get a transition from oxfos to fermentation, then the probability of getting cancer will be significantly reduced. So, but this is the this is the the balance act you have to you have to recognize. How do we know that? How do I how do we know that if we have the right diet and lifestyle that we will significantly reduce our risk for ever having to deal with cancer in the first place? And we know that from our historic evaluation of tribes, human um, tribes that live according to their uh, ancient ways. And there have been a number of people who have investigated Aboriginal peoples. Uh, these are peoples who still live in uh, non-Western side. Uh, they're, they're in jungles or they're in desert or they're in the, 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 the Arctic. Or Modern wherever. day hunter-gatherer tribes. Yeah, like Inuits from, from Canada and Alaska, you, you have, well, now today they're massively unhealthy. A lot of uh, sugar, when they a lot were, of alcohol today, but it wasn't that way yeah, before. Yeah, yeah. So those, tr those, those folks uh, were living, the, in fact, there was c comments that, you know, Inuits, Eskimos uh, never get cancer. And they eat, you know, fatty blubber and they eat whales and they eat seals and they eat fish and they eat this kind of stuff. And they don't eat many vegetables because, you know, where are you going to go and when it's 40 below zero to get, to get a, a piece of fruit. But, but in, in, in the summer, certainly they, they could gather some of these things up. Um, but uh, the great physician, um, humanitarian Albert Schweitzer, uh, recorded the African tribes uh, had no cancer. A, 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 he looked for 40,000 people were evaluating, he couldn't find any cancer. So what are these guys doing? Uh, they were pretty much following uh, a very excess, very a lot of physical exercise, uh, very low carbohydrate foods that they were eating, um, and, and they had a very different um, uh, diets and lifestyles. So uh, during the Paleolithic period of our past, uh, you know, where did we? We didn't farm. We went. We were hunter gatherers. Hunter. What does that mean? Hunter. You're killing stuff and eating it. You're gathering nuts and berries whenever you could seasonally. Uh, every we we now know from 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 uh, research, most of those folks were always in a state of ketosis, um, what we call nutritional ketosis, where blood sugars are low uh, and ketones are elevated because there's no carbohydrates, very few carbohydrates in our diets. You don't get much carbohydrate eating eating uh, organic meat, uh, internal organs. You don't get much carbohydrates eating natural. Um, you could get a little bit from berries, but they'd be seasonal. Tubers. So you don't really. Yeah. I mean, but you're you're not you're not farming them. So the Neolithic period is when civilization started, basically when we started farming and growing food in a in a in a, in a location where people would gather around the food. But even then, there was a lot of exercise and the kinds of foods that we wheat and corns and rice and this kind of stuff. Um they were not high glycemic varieties uh, of these foods. We have now made super sweet rice, corn, uh, wheats, and now we've even processed them into called uh, highly processed carbohydrates with zero nutritional benefit, all high carbohydrate. And uh, this, this with, a, with a diet lifestyle that we have today is absolutely the, uh, the cause 
of almost all of our chronic diseases. What are they? Type 2 diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, cancer, dementia. These are all related to diet and lifestyle. Yeah, there's a few guys that might have a genetic predisposition to one of these things or another, but the majority of the folks, it's ourselves. And, you know, people blame our genes. Uh, oh, you know, uh, it's not, our genes are doing exactly what they evolved to do, store energy. We, we evolved as a species that was hungry all the time. We, we were always tracking down food to, get to, to, to find out we needed to store energy. It's hard to store energy when you're eating only meats and certain vegetables that have very, very few uh, highly processed carbs. So now you take that same metabolism and you throw it into a new environment where you have massive amounts of highly processed carbohydrates, minimal amounts of exercise and energy, and you get fat, all right? The, because we evolved to store energy and the genes that allowed us to survive on the planet as a species are now counterproductive to our health because we're in a totally new environment, killing us uh, and causing an enormous amount of our, our uh, financial resources to be thrown into managing chronic diseases, all most of which are caused by a diet and uh, minimal exercise uh, and, and, and consumption of highly processed foods, and it's convenient. Okay, you, how many people are sitting in traffic jams in every major city in this country? We're, uh, 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 rush hour, you're sitting in traffic jams. You're, you're, eating, you're, you're sucking down on a, a high carbohydrate coffee, a muffin. You're, you're driving the car. You get into work. You sit in front of a computer. You run home. The kids are crying. You got to put some something in the microwave real quick that's highly processed. You give it to the kids. You get childhood obesity. You get chronic diseases. And you start creating all these problems that were very new to our uh, our society. And now you're going to come out with billions of dollars trying to figure out how, how I'm going to stop obesity, how I'm going to stop type 2 diabetes, how I'm going to stop cancer, what am I doing about dementia? And, 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 the, and, we're, and we're, we're not taking charge of what we know we should be doing. So we have a, institutions will come in and say, oh, take that pill, take this pill. We're going to treat you with this and treat you with that. But the real cause of it all, you got to go back to prevention. Okay. And it's hard. I'm not saying this is easy. I mean, the, the way we're running our society today, everybody's on the go all the time. Everybody's just locked into a computer with headsets, walking around with headsets on. I, I, I mean, I mean, we're, we're just deviated so far uh, in a short period of time, you know, a few hundred years into this new environment. And it's accelerating and massively accelerating uh, with the with the technology that we have, making our lives easier and easier, putting us at more and more risk for chronic diseases. And, and, uh, and then you end up with cancer and then you're trying to figure, oh, what's this cancer? You know, the dementia, man, what's all the, that's another epidemic. A a obesity is an epidemic. Dementia is an epidemic. Cancer is an epidemic. And it's all coming from changes, rapid changes in our diet and lifestyle over the last, over the last, uh, you know, several, several decades. Well, well, you chatted about diet and I want to just clarify a couple points there to make sure, you know, that our audience, obviously we've done a lot of episodes on diet. It's not that you're saying that, you know, obviously carbohydrates and sugar can't be a part of a healthy diet. We're really talking about getting those sources from whole foods and making sure that our calorie, total calories from those sources are stayed within reason, which generally, if you avoid ultra processed foods, especially high fructose, sweetened, you know, drinks, you know, ultra concentrated fruit juices, things like that, fast food, if you're generally going to stay away from that and eat and focus on whole foods and good amount of protein, you're going to be okay with the combination of not having a sedentary lifestyle. Would you agree? Well, I, I think it's also the fast food industry as well. I yeah. mean, you got, you got to, you got to, you got to recognize how tasty those things are. I mean, this is like, I mean, we evolved to want glucose. We evolved as a species to like sweet things. And now we have so much of it everywhere. I mean, you take some of those Subway sandwiches or whatever the, you know, these, uh, whatever, whatever these big hero sandwiches I mean, they've got so much sugar in the bread, you can't call it bread, right? So they have to call it a pastry, uh, a confectionery. Um, I mean, that's not natural. But it, man, does it taste good. It's unbelievable. You ever have a McDonald's quarter pounder? You, you tremble while you eat it so damn good. I mean, it's not like we're, we're making foods that people, oh, I don't want to eat that. Oh, are you kidding me? I mean, that stuff is really good stuff. I mean, you wash it down with a big milkshake. I, I mean... <laughs> 
<laughs> you gotta love it, right? You get those new Domino's pizzas. I mean, they're full of sugar in the in the tomato sauce. I mean, the bread's full of sugar. Everything is full of sugar. But man, does it taste good? Because we evolved to like that stuff. So it's not like because it was rare. Like, it was hard to it, find. Yes, and you know, and then you do, and then you, our technology allows us to make uh, a sugary. We found a mutation in corn years ago. The, the sugary gene. So uh, the corn kernels could make a lot more sugar and then you can make sweet corn. Right? <laughs> so, so everything is sweet, sweet, sweet. And then you process in the highly fruct high, high, high fructose corn syrups and you mix that in with everything else you're eating. And, and every, it's not like this stuff doesn't taste good, man. This stuff is really, really tasty. Sure. Which is and, why it's so hard to take a step back from it. Yes. And it does take some level of personal, Yes. You know, willpower to pull back, especially if we're addicted. But I will say this. The temptations, the temptations are everywhere. The temptations are everywhere, but your taste buds do change when you start to shift away from a lot of those foods. And I want to say for anybody who's struggling with it, a hundred percent, it's hard and you start to crave whole and healthy foods. It doesn't mean that I don't like sweets, just like the other, other person that's around there, but your tolerance for them shifts. And also Tony Robbins used to say this back in the day, but nothing tastes as good as being healthy feels when you feel great because your sleep is great. Now, diet is tough and it's one of those things that a lot of people struggle with and you have to find the diet that you can stick to and you manage calories and make sure you don't overeat, right? And there's a lot of different diets that can work there. One thing I do want to highlight on is that this is also tough, but this does feel like it's a good insurance policy. This is from the work of uh, Sachin Panda, one of the top researchers in sort of... Uh, circadian rhythm. And he shared this uh, paper the other day looking at uh, the role of exercise. It was titled The Role of Exercise in Obesity-Related Cancers. I'll share it over with, uh, with you, the current evidence and biological mechanisms. And essentially, he shared this graphic on Twitter. Um, and it was basically saying that exercise is the best, one of the best insurances against cancer. And the premium, just from the evidence of what we have today, is that 30 minutes a day of sweating genuinely makes a difference. Would you agree for a lot of people that in the category of prevention, one of the top things they can do today, in addition to the stuff that we talked about diet, which of course is hard, exercise is hard too, but anybody can start to get more exercise in their life and that will also help them in the prevention against cancer. Yeah, I agree. A anything that you feel that is, you found as a, you know, uh, supportive for you and your lifestyle? Well, yeah, I, th I think, you know, um, well, I'm, I'm at a university where all the kids are young and, uh, they're in the gym jumping around. They all want to look like the Adonis, you know, they're, they're, they're perfect bodies. They're, they're just like, I said, put 50 years and, and life on those bodies and see what happens. <laughs> but, but no, I, I agree. But I, but I think, um, you know, walking is probably one of the best exercises. Yeah. Walking is underrated. Uh, walking is easy because you don't, you don't have to go to a gym. Uh, you can just walk around the block or walk around a reservoir or walk around something, uh, swim a guy go, I want to people want to swim. Swimming is excellent, but you know, you got to go to a swimming pool somewhere. I mean, you're, you're working in an office and now you have to go somewhere, uh, get into a bathing suit, uh, swim around, put your clothes back on. And then, I mean, walking, you don't, you can just, you know, go out and, and do, uh, just walk around. It's a good way to clear your mind. It's a good way to start to focus on on things that you may not have been able to focus on uh, while you were working at the desk and doing your work, um, you know. And and it depends on the kind of of work you're doing. I mean, construction workers, of course, are outside and they're they're they have a lot more activity than some office workers say. But but we're all we're all in the same environment, um, and and we're all challenged by by by, by the same issues. Uh, you know, how, how are we going to try to prevent again, uh, cancer, uh, also obesity, because all these things are, are linked, you know, uh, with the smoke, anti-smoking campaign, obesity now has moved into, into a, a, a high risk factor for cancer, but obesity is also linked to type two diabetes, which is an epi another epidemic. Uh, well, all of that's related to elevated blood sugar and lack of exercise. So you can break it all down to blood sugar and exercise. If your blood glucose levels are too high and you don't exercise, I mean, you're going to get fat and you're going to put yourself at risk for systemic inflammation. The, the tragedy, the great tragedy I see is, is the little kids 
uh, that are adolescents, uh, that are that are preteens, are are getting obese. Um, this should never happen, because those poor folks are already are, are shutting their li their long term longevity down. They're going to be dead in their forties and fifties. They're not going to be lived to be seventy and eighty. Super They're all going to be dead soon. Not all, but a lot of them uh, are going to die prematurely. Uh, from this, and they don't think there's a problem with this, and we can't never allow our society to think it's okay to see a little kid that's obese. It's not okay, okay, because that unless you don't care about you know health issues, uh, and then you know as you age you put on weight, uh, mainly because you're not as active as you were when you were young, and the hormones in your body that burn energy become less and less, and you start to store. To store fat, so so I mean it's a, it's a lifestyle change, but man, it, it's 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 really cutting the life. It's really reducing overall survival for a lot of people in our in our society, and they're saying that some of the kids today being born are never are not going to live as long as some of the the their grandparents say say for example. Yeah. So you have a lot of this that has to do, uh, but again, you know we're focusing on cancer, uh, which is a real deadly. A, a type of, of situation that causes a tremendous amount of stress on people. And uh, we can manage that. I think we can do a better job than we're doing right now. Yeah. Uh, sleep is important. Obviously, there's been a lot that's written on the topic of sleep when it comes to lifestyle and how important that is when it comes to maintaining good metabolic health in the prevention category. I would be uh, sad if we didn't at least mention that, not that we have to go too deep into it, but sleep, you know, stress reduction, exercise, and a lot of people who are trying to get their you know, blood sugar under control. And, and they're, and especially for the, my audience that's listening, less so on YouTube, more on the podcast or on the audio, you know, they're, they're trying to dial into the perfect diet just by significantly putting attention into strength training or even being serious about walking, you know, and getting those 10,000 steps in a day. They can see dramatically huge improvements in their blood glucose just by in, including an exercise. Well, you know, 10,000 steps a day is, 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 uh, I mean, you got to be doing a lot of walking to get ten thousand steps. I know, but it's doable, right? It's like if we, oh, yeah. we have oh, yeah. to. In New York City, you, you walk from one side of the uh, the island to the other. I mean, you're going to get a lot of steps. But some people don't are sitting in cars in traffic, and uh, to get ten thousand steps, you're going to have to you're going to have to take a chunk of your of your day. Uh, you, I agree with you. Uh, you have to have a job that's going to give you that opportunity to take ten thousand steps for sure. Um, and that's and that's the kind of steps that you get cardiovascular exercise uh, exercise from as well. Yeah, it's, because it's, some people can walk back and forth and never really get their body into a rhythm. Yeah, and know? it's it's all hard. And part of this is that if you're a business owner or you're somebody that employs people, you want to be thinking about how can you even create a work environment that's more flexible and allows individuals. Of course, people are doing walking desks and other things, but the whole thing is hard. Diet's hard. Dialing in your sleep is hard. Exercise is hard. The whole thing is hard. But guess what's really hard is cancer is also getting cancer is also really hard. Yeah. And, 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 and also people like the easy way out. Uh, this is just part of our nature. Uh, that's why Ozampic, the pill for losing uh, uh, fat, right? It was a, di a diabetic drug. Everybody, a lot of people now are using it to lose weight. You don't have to, you don't have to suffer through uh, Weight Watchers and all these kinds of special diets. Just, just jack yourself up with Ozampic. Well, since you brought it up, all of a sudden, you, I mean, you see how many, how many people are doing it. It just tells you who are, who we are as a species. We don't want to walk. We want to just inject ourselves with Ozampic, lose the weight so we can look good. <laughs> well, let me ask you about it. Right? Well, that's who we are, right? That's who we are. We, you know, we've done a few episodes where different people have had shared their take on something like Ozempic, right? And obviously this is a podcast that's all about really embracing, you know, diet lifestyle factors that are there. But if somebody was considering something like Ozempic and there's a other, you know, GLP, I forgot exactly what they're called, GLP, uh, uh, any, anyways, if that was going to significantly help somebody reduce weight, now there's a bunch of other concerns like long-term side effects, which we don't know. Also the loss, you know, Peter Atia writing about the loss of lean muscle mass, which is an important part of helping you keep your blood glucose under control. But let's say if that was one of the solutions that was available to them, besides the fact that they have to be on it for the rest of their life, otherwise they're going to gain back the weight. Would you see that as one of the tools in the toolbox to lower our risk of cancer since obesity is so directly, you know, correlated with uh, 
obesity and cancer have that correlation that's there. Yeah, I can't speak to that. I haven't tested Ozempic in my in my uh, cancer models. Yeah. So uh, I can't really. Uh, I, I I I I talk only a, a lot of what I've researched and what I've done in the lab. Sure. And sure. see the results. No, I appreciate myself. that. Yeah, I thought you because you brought it up. I was going to ask you about it. No, but I brought it up because I know members of our species would love to do things that don't require too much effort on their part. A pill, the taking of a pill. Uh, why, why should I have to do a ketogenic diet when I can take a pill? In fact, we've always talked about the ketogenic diet and a pill. And uh, for the epilepsy, you know, my, my friend John Rowe, uh, who, 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 had, who had gave a big lecture one time on, on uh, can we find a ketogenic diet on a pill? And because why should we have to suffer eating foods that may not be palatable just so we can have this health benefit? But uh, I, I think this is the easy way out. Uh, you know, do you want do you want to do you want to do prevent cancer? Do you want to treat cancer by doing metabolic therapy, or is it just simply easier for you to go into the into the into the oncology ward, uh, sit down in a lounge chair, and, and have someone infuse a poisonous chemical into your veins, or sitting in a chair and have them mark an area on your body where they can zap you with a radiation? Uh, that's a hell of a lot easier uh, than doing the kinds of things that would also manage the disease, but it's going to require a significant input uh, and uh, activity on your part. So there's those who want to be participatory in their health and those that people who don't want to be participatory in their health. And they just want or to don't have the work. resources or are in a situation where they literally are working three or four jobs and they can't think. And that's obviously now where we get back to this idea of, you know, of course, there's personal responsibility for everybody who's listening today, who probably more likely than not has some resources to make some changes in their life. But really, if we want to be able to get this out to everybody, you know, we're going to have to have major institutions and potentially the government really fundamentally having a completely different approach to health in society. I'm not holding my breath for that to happen, but that's going to have to happen. Otherwise, well, we have a split in society. There's a whole group of people that are getting a lot healthier, which is a very small percentage of the population. And there's a whole group of people that are getting super unhealthy very quickly. Yes. And I think, well, I mean, this is the thing. People need to know what's putting them at risk. And a lot of times they do know, but they really don't have the resources not to do what they're doing. So uh, it's really, it's really, um, I don't know, it's a, it's a tough question. It's a, it's a tough situation. Well, I want to move out of prevention for a second and go back to people that are diagnosed with cancer or looking for resources. You know, you mentioned a, a clinic that you're aware of in Istanbul. And I know that there's these different clinics that are spread around the world. Obviously, a lot of them are not going to be accepting American insurance and things like that. Are those clinics a potential option? You know, I'm not going to name any by name unless if there's any ones that you feel comfortable to name. I know there's some in Mexico, some places that use you know, water only fasting. Um, I'm not aware of anybody that's implementing the specific approach that you're taking, but are more aware of therapeutic approaches like the ketogenic diet, you know, clinics in Germany. Are, are those an option, again, potentially for people who have resources who are diagnosed with cancer? Yeah, I, I think so. But but again, uh, we're working on the treatment protocol now, and, and hopefully we can get it published which is a really comprehensive way. And we put together with people, my, my friends and people I know in the field who have studied this for quite a long period of time, who are all going to be making comments and, and signing off on this strategy. And until you have to have a protocol for treatment, you have to have two things. You have to have a correct protocol for treatment and you have to have a place where you can go to get the treatment. So I think the frustrating part right now from many of the comments that I get from these podcasts is, oh, I talk the talk, but where do we go? You know, nobody's, I, I've outlined what we need to do, but who's going to do that for me? Who can help me do that? I, I'm not a physician. People are calling me, all these phone calls that I'm getting, they're, they're all asking, you know, where do I go? How do I do it? Where should, you, well, that should be your major oncology centers uh, should, be, should be the one. Well, they're not doing it. Okay. And so even the clinics that are publishing some of these case reports, as you've mentioned, that you're well, working uh, yeah, together, yeah. are, are, are right. those a potential? Again, most likely it's not going to be covered by insurance and people are going to have to have some resources. But would that be a potential resource for people that had resources? Yeah, I, I think the time I think we uh, there are a number of people that are really many physicians that are, 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 are would like to set up clinics, uh, established you know, brick and mortar place to go where a patient would be 
brought through, followed through the entire process by a team, not handed off like we do in the medical schools. You come in, you get the diagnosis. Okay, you're handed off to the next guy who does the treatment, then you're handed off to this other guy. Um, you like to have a team that follows you from start to finish, um, knowing precisely how to deal with the issues uh, as you go through the treatment process. Um, you know, and, and, and listen, if I had cancer, having written the protocol, knowing everybody that I know in the field and knowing what I know, I would certainly want to work with one of my colleagues just to bounce things off of. I wouldn't want to do everything, even though I know what to do and how to do it. I still want to talk to one a, a, a knowledgeable person just to run things by them. You know, it's like anything. Uh, you, you really want to work. You really want to speak to somebody just to make sure that the, the newest evidence, the newest discussions and things that you might not have been recognized, uh, might not have recognized. And I think the cancer patient who may not have any uh, wherewithal in this whole thing would certainly need guidance. And uh, an app. So we're trying to build apps where a lot of the patient can do can play a very significant role in their health management, uh, knowing that they're shouldering a lot of what needs to be done. But they would like to share their glucose ketone index values uh, with the trained professional and have that trained professional, if they f fall out of the, the nutritional guideline, or I should say the key, the, the zone, what we call the therapeutic zone of, of efficacy, uh, what, 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 how do we get back into the zone? What did you do to fall out of the zone? And they could say, I did this. And well, okay, modify that, modify this, get yourself back into the zone. That's why we built the glucose ketone index calculator to allow cancer patients to know what nutritional zone they should be in to create the greatest amount of pressure on stopping the fermentation of their tumor. So, and then I realized after we did this, how hard it was for the cancer patients to get into these zones. And, and I was working, looking at the students that could easily get into these zones. These are young people that have no cancer, no, they're all very healthy, and they can get into these zones uh, quite easily. But when you're an older person with cancer, and now you're subjected to chemo and you're subjected to these treatments, it, your blood sugars go up, your systemic inflammation goes up, and now it becomes a real challenge for these cancer folks to get into these zones, which initially I thought were, were quite achievable, but now I'm realizing steroids and all kinds of stuff that you're given to the cancer patient keeps them out of the zone. And they're struggling and they're, oh, I've done this and I've done that and I can't. And, and a lot of the treatments they have are pushing them out of these zones. So, uh, you know, when we did it with the preclinical system, we were not radiating and giving toxic poisons to these mice. I mean, we got these animals in these zones and all this kind of stuff pretty quick. So, and dogs too. I mean, I published a big paper on the dog. Diet alone resolved the mast cell tumor. So, um, so it, it's much easier uh, to do it if you're kind of healthy at the beginning. It's much more difficult to get into the zone when you're, when you're not healthy. Is, er, is early detection also a big part of this too? And there's uh, you know, a bunch of new things that are out there, everything from like Grail's blood testing, which obviously is super sensitive and you got to be aware of that and work with the right practitioner on it to things like uh, whole body scans, like uh, I think there's a company called, I have no affiliation with them, but like Pernova, who are doing whole body scans and they're able to detect a lot of these because generally from what I understand and people like physicians like Peter Atia, you've been on his podcast before, you guys had a really good discussion and and a, and a lot of, he, he stress tests a lot of your ideas in a good way and you had great responses for them. We'll link to that in the show notes. Are those a part of the process again? Well, I, I think, yeah, I, th I think when you come to, I, I like the idea of non-invasive detection, non-invasive management. Yeah, talk about that because you have a whole philosophy on, on invasive versus non-invasive. Yeah, well, I think, I, well, it's a very cutting edge thing. And I think, you know, the industries are working on what we call liquid biopsy. Right. Uh, where we can where we can try to identify where and what type of cancer a person may have by by looking at markers in the bloodstream. So you just need to take some blood, evaluate the, a, a whole array of markers and then predict what type of cancer it might be, where it might be, and then do a more a more thorough evaluation without actually disturbing the micro environment of, of, of the tumor itself. Um, because right now we do, we do, uh, a tissue by many times, not always, but we do tissue biopsy. Right. And, Somebody and feels, a woman feels a lump on her breast or. Yeah. Yeah. 
and then goes in and says, is this cancerous or not? So then they're going to be taking a biopsy with a needle. Uh, yes. And or a, a mass on the lung, uh, a mass somewhere, you know, we need to a prostate, you know, whatever, whatever tissue happens to be the tissue that's involved. Uh, a confirmatory diagnosis is involved with a, um, a biopsy, which is taking a sample of the tissue, uh, 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 analyzing it under the microscope and saying whether or not the, the cells look uh, malignant or not. Uh, which is then the judgment of the pathologist making a decision about what he sees uh, under the microscope. My my, my uh, recognition of seeing dozens and dozens of studies, and I have some of them published in our breast cancer paper, by, by taking the, the biopsy, you actually disturb the microenvironment uh, of the mass that you are evaluating. And you could actually create, uh, a, a make a bad situation worse uh, in, 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 in taking uh, material to determine whether or not you have uh, a malignancy or not. And if it, is, if, if it were to be malignant, uh, that, that, that mass that you see uh, with CAT scan, PET scan, or, or, or lump feeling a lump, and it does happen to be malignant, then stabbing it would not be the best, in the best interest of the patient. You run the risk of called inflammatory oncotaxis. It's a well-known phenomenon where cancer cells can spread around the body uh, by disturbing the microenvironment. That was one of the reasons they get rid of the morselation procedure for uterine polyps. They had this machine that would grind up polyps, and it was causing, in some people, metastatic cancer uh, because you ground up polyps, fragmented the tissue, got into the bloodstream, and became metastatic. So this is the same thing. You got to be very, very careful. You don't want to disturb the the, the microenvironment. So well, what do you do? Well, you institute metabolic therapy and you have several things that can happen. Uh, number one, it goes away completely. Number two, it gets smaller or it doesn't grow anymore. Uh, and then you say, whoa, it's stabilized. Okay, then then consider the surgical debulking completely uh, because you, you could then reduce the inflammation around the mass, uh, which is key to not spreading it. If you can put the fire, inflammation is fire. Put the douse the fire with metabolic therapy so it's not so angry, and the borders become sharper, and the surgeon can take the whole thing out without worrying about spreading it. So, uh, so there's a lot of uh, key strategies that one could do to reduce risk of spreading something that should not uh, should be manageable very at the very beginning. But they don't do that because they are clueless as the, uh, the concept of metabolic therapy as an upfront a treatment for this, so or, or an, a, an approach. And what I'm telling you is not, oh, you're like Peter was saying, oh, you could cause fear in, in a lot of people by that saying, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm just telling you what the biopsies. Yeah, I'm just telling you what's already been seen in the scientific literature. Right. Why don't the patient, oh, and, oh, and, well, of course, Peter said that, oh, it happens very rarely. Yeah, like what, one out of 200 people. What about the, the, the one person who got it spread all over because you took a biopsy on it? And just to connect and, and, the dots, just to make sure that people don't, people are not, we're not losing anybody, is that you have a concern that if people are going in with these invasive biopsies, that the fear is that if you are disrupting that lo local microenvironment, you could have cancer cells that get released from one area, let's say the breast tissue, and spread to other areas, and then could cancer then end up taking up in that area that it spread to. And Peter Atia, and again, I'm not sophisticated enough to ask all the follow-up questions. I'm not a physician, researcher. I'm just a lay person here interviewing. But I would encourage people to listen to that back and forth that you had because you had some great answers. And your thing was that still, if it's rare, potentially one in 200, it could still happen. And I understand where Peter is coming from too, which is that his concern is that, well, there, you know, are people just not going to go seek out care? And I understand your answer to that, which is that, in the ideal world, if we had the metabolic therapy approach to treating cancer, we would see that many more people would get better just from that alone. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And then you could actually get rid of it much more cleanly without causing any uh, reducing risk of spread. So there's a lot of ways that we can already uh, reduce uh, cancer. Uh, we're not arguing that we need, we need to have some diagnostic uh, procedures, of course, you have a lot of things, CAT scan, MRI, PET scans, there's a, way, a lot of different things you can do up front. Well, we can't do it this time. We have to do a biopsy first. Why? 
What do you need to do the biopsy? You, you, you're disturbing the microenvironment. Well, we need to know if it's malignant. Well, if it's malignant, you should never be sticking it in the first place. So, so because then you really uh, increase the potential risk uh, for spreading the cancer. But shrink but it down. One, one question for you. So don't, in the case of, uh, let's say my mom who was diagnosed with the breast cancer, who's doing fantastic, by the way, and her approach at that time, I've talked about it before in previous podcasts, was we kind of had to assemble a ragtag team of people. We had to kind of convince her oncologist. She had a functional medicine doctor who was involved in her treatment, who herself is a breast cancer survivor, Dr. Elizabeth Bohm, and a few other people that were part of it, and a cancer researcher named Ralph Moss, who's put together a lot of different reports over the years. Um, and that was a big part of her you know, team and, and her approach. But in the case for her, I believe when they did a biopsy, they found that her cancer was HER2 positive, and they also got a chance to understand what uh, drugs would be the most supportive for that type of cancer that she had. Is that not part of the reason to potentially have a biopsy done? Yeah, I mean, you, you certainly can do it, but we all we already know her two positive, triple negative, or any of these things—they're all fermenters. Mm -hmm. the, the, regardless, so, so you're saying regardless, what, it wouldn't it, change the approach of at least the metabolic therapy. No, no, you're still going to get rid of it. Uh, you're still going to remove it. It's just that you would want to remove it in an indolent state rather than in a potentially more uh, uh, aggressive state. Um, you know, th there's a lot of lumps that you can look at. There's a lot of different ways you can you can do this. The the idea of doing a metabolic approach up front r r uh, reduces the risk of spread when you do the surgical debulking. So it's not, and then you can analyze it after the surgical debulking if it's shrunken down. You can still look at it pathologically and see what it looks like. And in many cases, it becomes like, oh, this is not an aggressive cancer. Well, it could have been if you took a biopsy from the very beginning. These are judgment calls that have to be made by both the patient and the, and, and, and the and physician. Team, right. So her two, yeah. So HER2 negative can spread. People can die from HER2 negative cancers, uh, breast cancer. They, they have triple negative breast, which has none of the markers on the surface, uh, these kinds. Um, but, you know, and there are drugs uh, for this. But, but the bottom line that we have looked at is the mitochondria are abnormal and HER2 positive, uh, uh, PR positive, uh, 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 triple negative. The mitochondria are normal. What does that mean? That means whatever cells are in that mass are going to have to be using glucose and glutamine. So we already know what those cells are doing in there. Why don't we shut their fuels off, collapse them, potentially get rid of them, and then what's ever left, surgically debulk it, reducing the risk of, of, of having spread. Now, of course, a lot of women are going to go through the standard and not, and not have to worry about recurrent metastatic cancer. But many of them do. And, and the issue is you want to reduce the risk of spreading something that doesn't need to be provoked. I mean, you, you can manage some of these things without provocation and making the outcome better than, not, I mean, there's going to be good outcomes for a lot of people. Don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying that everybody sure. who, who gets stuck with, a, as Peter said, you know, it doesn't happen that often, but it happens enough to know that there are many, many scientific reports in the literature describing inflammatory oncotaxis coming from the biopsy of the tissue itself in an attempt to determine uh, what it is. And people should be aware and they have to make that decision with their care team. Yeah, I think, I think, but right now the problem is what I just relayed to you is not known, understood, or recognized by the majority of those working in the oncology field. They're not aware of what I just said. Yeah. They don't read the scientific literature describing what I just said. Because when I told Peter about, oh, I didn't read it. I said, Peter, you got to read the literature. It's there. If you, if you just read the papers, you're going to see. I've seen it for prostate, breast, colon, lung, liver, all of these different cancers where inflammatory oncotaxis has been documented in the scientific literature. Okay? So it's not, a, it's, it's not something that's never been seen. Oh, I didn't know about that. Well, how often do you read the papers like I read these papers? I'm sitting there going, wow, look at this. Do, they, do these guys know about this? <laughs> well, they never speak about it. They, that means they don't know about it. Yeah. If they did, you should upfront the patient and say, listen, there's an outside chance this technique could spread it around. All, all the uh, reason why. Outside. I'm not saying a, a guarantee. I'm just saying there's an outside risk factor associated with this. Yeah. All the reason why, again, early detection is a big part of getting to, you know, the earlier you treat yeah. cancer. And especially if you can find a non-invasive way to detect your cancer yes. early, 
yeah. you can get on the train early and you know, you've shared this before, but everybody's so worried and they call you all the time and say, well, what if this metabolic therapy, which is essentially, I don't know. I know you don't like that term because it's a lot more than the ketogenic diet. It's a bunch of lifestyle things, exercise, sleep, you know, reducing stress, but diet is a big part of it. They're so concerned that what if the patient has a negative response to this, right? And your thing is that, look, what do you have to lose? It will be tough, right? But what do people have to lose? And based on your mechanism of action that you've displayed, you've presented the argument here, you have everything to gain. Yeah, I, I, you, have, you have a lot to gain. Uh, or or let's, I don't like to say gain. I think you have, these are called risk, risk assessments. And you, you want to do things that are going to re- make the lowest level of risk for uh, making something uh, worse than it actually has to be. So um, I, I think a lot of these tumors and cancers can be managed very, very effectively uh, without invasive procedures uh, if people know what to do and how to do it. Uh, and you know, here I'm speaking uh, about what I understand from years of reading research and doing my own experiments and seeing what's happening uh, to a field that doesn't read the same kinds of information uh, or is not privy to it. Um, so you have this gap. There's no consensus discussion uh, about this. Is it possible that we could, yes, early detection is great. If we can detect it early with non-invasive procedures and then manage it with non-invasive procedures and then go in at the end with an invasive surgical debulking removal uh, to, in, uh, to significantly reduce the possibility of making something worse than it has to be. So it has to, again, be a team. The surgeon plays a big role in this, you know? Um, so, and as I said, why, why are we sticking this thing? Well, we need to know whether it's benign or malignant. And then they want to do a gene profile readout on a lot of these things to tell you what kind of mutations you have in, in the tumor. Uh, that's another thing that they, it's a big industry looking at the mutations in the tissue. But if the mutations are all downstream effects, then most of that stuff is irrelevant anyway. What are you worried about? If, if they can't use, if they're fermenting and you take away their fermentable fuels, the, 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 the mutations go away because the cancer cells die. Yeah, you know, so, you, so, you, you essentially are living in the future with your cancer therapy approach, but we have to fight to raise the awareness. And really with the people that are listening today, they should be the people to demand to their, anybody that's listening, including the doctors, that we need a different yeah, approach. You know, the problem what I'm telling people and on these podcasts and stuff, you know, it might create anxiety in a lot of people because, and I feel bad about it too. I mean, you're asking me what I, what I do. I mean, this is what I do for a living, right? I read all these papers all the time. I test this stuff on preclinical systems. I have my, my clinician friends try it on cancer patients. We publish case reports. We see really quite significant outcomes. So, so, um, but yet the people say, well, yeah, yeah, this is the greatest stuff. And they go down to their oncologist. Oh, no, that doesn't work. No clinical trials. There's no evidence to support anything Seafried's saying. Well, well, what, well show me the evidence that's, that's not supporting it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, it's just one of those kinds of things. I, you know, I, I know you're joking a little bit that you feel bad, but it's important that this information gets out there. It's, people, it's important that people understand the lay of the land. It's important that people understand really that this super scary disease, cancer, that our bodies are not just innately messed up, that something just went completely wrong. There are genetic forms of mutations of, of, of cancers that are very rare, right? Genetic, genetically. Uh, They're second, secondary risk factors. S- secondary every, risk factors. Every one, every, every one of those inherited mutations, like BRCA1 and P53 and all these others, they damage mitochondria. They disrupt oxidative phosphorylation. So there's, so someone who has a BRCA1, because not every woman who has BRCA1 develops a breast tumor. Of course. It's about 50 or 60% penetrant. If you have a mutation inherited that's 100% penetrant, then that's a primary cause of the problem. But since all the mutations are not 100% penetrant, they are risk factors. Just as someone would be working in a, in a, in a factory with chemical carcinogens. Not everybody in the factory would get cancer from working with those chemical carcinogens. Right. Does your lifestyle turn those genes on? Do they turn them and, off? And the diet, the diet and lifestyle could provoke those chemical carcinogens or those genetic risk factors to become uh, uh, more prominent. Absolutely. So this is why you have to be aware of, of all of these things. I, I don't know if pro- prophylactic removal of organs 
is the best way to deal uh, with BRCA1. But I certainly think because it's not 100% penetrant, that means diet and lifestyle could certainly reduce the risk of having BRCA1 be, be, be uh, 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 reduce the risk of having that. Absolutely. That. Thomas, this has been fantastic. And as we're concluding over here, and this is, I mean, there's such a wealth of knowledge that you have. Help us understand a little bit more about your work and your research. Like how have you guys typically gone about the funding that allows you to document these cases as well as, you know, uh, publish and put out the education that you do? And is there any way that the folks that are listening today can be, you know, supportive in the process by putting their attention on anything? Well, our sport now comes predominantly from private foundations and from philanthropy. So, um, you know, we're, there's a number of people that uh, there are a number of folks out there that want to be part of a new movement and uh, a, a knowledge, a knowledge base approach uh, to managing cancer without toxicity. And they want to support us. Uh, they support us through funds to foundations supporting us and they support us by philanthropy. Uh, just say, I know I, 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 this is the future. What I've just described to you, press pulse metabolic therapy is going to be the future of cancer management and, and prevention in this country. Uh, how fast do we get there? Like you've in indicated, we have massive caverns. Uh, um, there's wall firewalls that have to be overcome. There's ideological dogma that has to be overcome. And there's a desire to be healthy and, and want to live. And those, all, all those things have to come together. But it's going to happen because it's based on the hard science. The science is telling us this is what is underlying the problem. And this is what you need to do to manage it. So there are some people. Now, I know there's some people that say, well, I got to try to figure make, how to make a buck on what Seafried is saying. You know, I, I'm, I'm not an entrepreneur. I, I, don't, I don't deal with those kinds of things. Our, our issue is how do we prove that what we're saying is correct? How many case reports can I write showing that people that, are, that should have been dead a long time ago are enjoying a, a quality of life far longer than they would have been? What's wrong with that? I mean, that's reward in itself to know that the, the ideas and the science that you've, that you've articulated and tested actually act, works. And ultimately, that's going to be the way people are going to come to know whether this stuff is right or not by seeing all these folks that should have been dead walking around with a fairly good, life, healthy and uh, pro prolonged life. That's, pre that's pretty much the evidence that you need to know that if you know, if you know your science is right, then you should have a lot of successful cases that, that, uh, uh, that, that are out there. And we're trying to write these up and we're writing a protocol so that we can get more and more of these folks. So there's people that are interested, intrinsically interested in this kind of stuff. And we're working out all the details right now. And the money that we get comes from private foundations and philanthropy to do this. And if anybody want, here wanted to be a part of that process and donate, is that a possibility? Yeah, well, they have Travis Christofferson's, you know, Foundations for Cancer Metabolic Therapy. He has a website called uh, that. Travis, it's the Foundation for Cancer Metabolic Therapies. His, his work supports us. And, you know, we have money from the English British Childhood Foundation. And we have a, a philanthropy, just folks that want to donate money to us through Travis's foundation. And, and, we, 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 and that keeps my research staff going. The preclinical animal models are expensive to work with. Uh, we, we have to work with a lot of different um, strat new strategies. We're, we're doing constantly looking for diet drug combos that will be even more effective than the ones we have right now. So press pulse, we're working on the whole concept of, of, of press and pulse synergistic interaction. And we're going to come up with very new kinds of non-toxic drugs working specifically with a new metabolic uh, body change. And this is going to be very devastating to the tumor cell and super healthy to the remaining cells of the body. So we, it's a, lot, a lot of it's trial and error, uh, what we call non-sexy science. This is not the kind of stuff you get big NIH grants for, uh, because uh, this is the stuff that's actually going to work in the clinic you know, this is the kind of stuff that, oh, is it that dosis? Is it this timing? Is it this scheduling of these three or four combos? Yeah, that's what works the best. Well, you can't write a grant up to the NIH to say, I want to try to do this. Well, that's unsexy. You know, uh, so we're not interested in sexy science. We're, we're interested in, 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 in therapeutic outcome. What, how long can you live with something that should have killed you and you're doing well? Uh, uh, that's, that's the ultimate goal. 
uh, and we don't want people losing their hair. We don't want people bleeding from their gums, you know, feeling like uh, horrible all the time, vomiting, nausea, all that kind of stuff. We, we, we want to try to eliminate that and have these people new emerge in a much more healthy, uh, healthy, knowing that they had a life-threatening condition that's, that's no longer life-threatening. So this is our strategy. And we're working to achieve that strategy. Yeah. And it's important work. I'd love to donate. I'll be in, I'll be in touch with your team. I'll make sure that we list inside of the show notes here if anybody else wants to be a part of the process. Because, you know, my hope would day is that the NIH wakes up or other you know big government institutions wake up and realize. But that's going to take a lot of momentum. Yeah, which has already you know, started, I'm, right? And thankful yeah. for new media means like YouTube and social media and podcasting to be able to help spread the word. But this is really the future of cancer therapy and you're bringing it to us right now. And I really appreciate you coming on the podcast and sharing as somebody who, you know, cancer has touched my life. My aunt passed away from cancer and my mom has had cancer, knock on wood. You know, we detected it early and she had an incredible team that supported her around it. And, and one of the first things that her functional medicine doctor did was basically talk to her about the importance of dramatically reducing the amount of carbohydrates that she was on and and completely switching her lifestyle and getting her exercise up all the things that you talked about here on prevention well that makes that makes everything the other approaches might work much better absolutely absolutely and of course uh, you know she did have some uh uh shortened radiation st you know there's a place for you know there's a place for these other tools and 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 things that are in the context if you're if the team determines it but if we can add diet and lifestyle factors to it that's going to be you know as you mentioned, it's going to make it much more likely to happen. Thomas, if people want to keep in touch with you, if, do you where do you want to send them? Well, um, you know, a number of people are emailing me for information, uh, which I send out in an email uh, rather than phone, the thousands of phone calls. I mean, you know, the phone I, was ringing um, off the hook while we were doing the interview. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I just don't know what to say. Maybe I should stop doing all this stuff and get back to just teaching students in the in the. But we, but we, you know, we have this research. We've started to publish open access. People can read all my papers. It's open access. It's not like you have to be a member of some scientific society. Um, yeah, donate to Travis Christofferson's foundation. I, I think that that'll keep us going uh, because we're here for the long haul. Uh, we're not going anywhere. So, um, but but you're right. I I I have to have a new. I I don't know what to say. Since these podcasts have started, it's like I'm being buried. Uh, with all these poor folks that I'd, I'd love to be able to, you know, give them, we're working on the treatment protocol now. And I think once we can publish this treatment protocol, then it becomes at least something to do and, and we can set up these clinics. Um, but, uh, that, that it's coming, let, 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 I, I, I wish I had something to it say, takes, go it to takes this time. Clinic. It takes time. It takes time. And I feel and bad resources. for all the folks. And resources. Yeah. Uh, resources. You know, but yeah. but you're right. It's it's a pittance compared to what we're spending on this disease. Yeah. Uh, uh, currently. Well, thank you again for being here. Super appreciate you. Hope to have you back in the future. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Hey, YouTube, if you enjoyed what you just saw, keep watching for more great content on how to improve your brain and your life. 70 percent of the people are still by definition clinically depressed, even with treatment. It gets worse than that, though, because if you follow those people for 12 years and you see how they fare,